Thank you all for coming. Is this microphone working? Yes. Excellent. I'm John Michael. I'm the chair of the English department, and I will be very brief. My function is largely to get out of the way, um, but I do want to welcome you all to this penultimate event in this year's Centennial Plutzik Celebration Reading Series. And I wanted to thank uh, particularly everyone who made this possible today, uh, just very quickly beginning with the Plutzik Foundation and the Plutzik Reading staff, Jen Groats, Steve Schottenfeld, Ken Gross, uh, Jim Longenbach and Joanna Scott. And I also want to send a special thanks out to the staff in the English department who does all of the heavy lifting to make these events happen. Uh, Renee Henninger, Mary Ellen Felton, Lucy Peck in particular are up in the back somewhere. Thank you all. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Joanna Olmsted, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Hello, it's a great pleasure to be here on this occasion and to celebrate, help all of us celebrate the 50th uh, anniversary of this wonderful reading series. Um, on behalf of the university, we're particularly honored to have the U.S. Poet Laureate, Philip Levine, here to, to help us celebrate. Um, one of the things that I think uh, many of you probably already know is this series is in honor of Chaim Plutzik, who was a professor of English and a poet. And uh, at the time of his untimely death, 50 years ago, um, many of his friends, his family, wanted to honor him both as a person and as a poet by establishing something that would be a continuing legacy of his uh, love of literature and poetry and of, again, gatherings that would encourage that. And um, we're very honored today to have Tanya Plutzik, his, his widow, with us in this lovely red dress down in the front. And uh, obviously, partly through her, her passion for continuing this legacy and, and honoring him, uh, as well as many, many friends who contributed to this, this series actually has the astonishing record of being the longest standing literary reading series in the country that, that we're aware of, which is, I think, fabulous. So <laughs> we're very pleased about that. Um, I think uh, I, again, will follow John's lead and say my important role is to now get out of the way. But in, to, before doing that, I have the great pleasure of introducing Jen Groats, who will introduce our poet. Uh, Jen is an assistant professor in English. Uh, has already herself received astounding uh, recognition for the excellence of her poetry, including a uh, placement of three of her poems in the American Best Poetry Series. And this past year, her book, The Needles, was uh, mentioned, basically highlighted by NPR as one of the five best books of poetry in 2011. And it's a great, great pleasure to introduce her. Is there, can you hear all right in the back or is it too loud? Is there a little, ear? okay, thank you, thank you. Um, quickly before I start my introduction, I just wanted to make two announcements. The first is that there is one more series this, or one more event this spring in the Plutzik 5100 um, series and that's a poetry lecture on April 24th, um, by, give, which will be given by Rosanna Warren and that's gonna be 5 p.m. as usual in the Wells Brown Room. So be sure that's on your calendar. And the second announcement is just that right after the reading, I'm sure that Philip Levine will be happy to sign books up in the, be book in the, in the back, um, and books will be for sale. When I was a senior in college, I decided that I would write an honors thesis in poetry. So I went to the office of the one poet professor on my campus I brought a sheaf of my poems and I asked him if he would work with me. One by one, he read the poems aloud, expressionless, and then he looked me in the face and he said, I'm sorry, but these are completely awful. <laughs> really, I said? 
Well, I've never taken a poetry workshop before. Could you tell me what's wrong with them? He said, they're sentimental. They're overly romantic. They've got burning candles and angels in them. <laughs> and they sound like they were written by a drunk Patsy Cline. <laughs> oh, I said. Well, is there anything that I can do to become a better poet, I asked. And he said, yes, stop being yourself in your poems. Go read Philip Levine. And then write a dramatic monologue in the voice of a laid off Detroit auto worker whose job was just outsourced to Japan. If you can do that, my professor challenged, then I'll agree to work with you. Now, why did my teacher say that? Well, partly because he was right, my poetry needed to change, but it wasn't because I needed to stop being myself, but more like I needed a more authentic way to be and thereby speak as myself. But I tell this anecdote today because of the second part of his advice and what it reveals about our special guest. For many readers, Philip v Levine has been particularly well known for his poems set in the blighted urban landscape of Detroit and for his strong identification with ethnic and working class issues where, as one critic has noted, the poems display an undertone of rage and defiance. This is surely the Levine my teacher challenged me to emulate. And even now, especially with the ever brief sound bite sized encapsulations media have to describe our current poet laureate, the poet of the working class remains a useful thumbnail. And not without reason, some of Levine's greatest poems, poems I believe will last well into the next century, come from this landscape and from the characters encountered on the night shift of the Cadillac or Chevrolet gear and axle factory floor. And indeed, these poems have already had such an influence on a whole generation of contemporary poets who had previously felt their own lives could never be valid material for poetry. This is no small corrective to abstract poems about angels and so on. But if Levine's poetry is powerful enough to spark a movement, to initiate followers, it is also considerably more complex and varied and subtle than what many poets and reviewers have essentialized. Indeed, in a single poetic career of a great poet, and Philip Levine certainly counts as one, there is a complete education to be had for the reader. After I left my professor's office, I went straight to the library and I did what I always did when I'd heard mention of a new poet. I checked out all of his books, I stacked them in chronological order, and I read them from beginning to end. I read the Detroit poems and I wrote my own. It wasn't good. I can remember only one image about the auto worker being able to smell lotus flower and the gasoline of his own car. <laughs> but the real breakthrough of that assignment by my professor was the discovery I made that Philip Levine was going to be a great poetic friend to me, regardless of whether we'd ever meet in person. We had, as far as I was concerned, everything in common. And though he didn't write about angels, he did write with a romantic, dare I say, visionary intensity and in lyricism. And ever since then, it has been a joy and privilege for me to ponder so much about Levine's poetry, his developing and also his recurring subject matters, his fascinating formal innovations of the line, voice, image, his aesthetic and political assertions and vacillations, his playfulness, his exploration of memory and loss, and a sort of metaphysical boxing match the work enacts between bitterness and overwhelming gratitude. I hope that you have had the joy of a similar friendship with Philip Levine. 
or perhaps that you are starting one just today, please help me welcome Philip Levine. Thank you, Jennifer. I know where it's Jennifer. People here seem to call her Jen, but I call her Jennifer. I'm very formal. Uh, <laughs> I'd also like to say, uh, thank the Plutzig family for supporting poetry, uh, which is, I think, worth doing. And I'm going to read my own poems in a in a crappy voice today <clears throat> because I'm, I don't know if I have a cold or allergies, I don't know, but I, stop whining, Philip, I say to myself, <laughs> I'll just read the goddamn poem. <clears throat> All right, I mean, to be honest, I, I, I'm not happy all the time to be identified as the poet of the working class. I stopped doing heavy work when I was about 20, uh, 27. And now I'm 84. And I've been sitting on my ass ever since. Yeah. Uh, I feel comfortable with working people. Uh, we speak the same language. But I, I also feel pretty comfortable with middle class people especially if they're picking up the check, <laughs> which I hope happens later today. <laughs> All right, let me, th this is my, this is my best-selling book, and so of course I love it. Uh, and uh, what work is, and I'll read the title poem, which, you know, and then we get all this work stuff, and then I can, I can get into my real love, which is Wagner. Uh, <laughs> actually, actually, he makes an entrance into this poem. You'll, you'll hear what I think of. What work is? We stand in the rain in a long line, waiting at Ford Highland Park for work. You know what work is. If you're old enough to read this, you know what work is, although you may not do it. Forget you. This is about waiting. Shifting from one foot to another, feeling the light rain falling like mist into your hair, blurring your vision, until you think you see your own brother ahead of you, maybe 10 places. You rub your glasses with your fingers, and of course, it's someone else's brother. Narrower across the shoulders than yours, but with the same sad slouch the grin that does not hide the stubbornness, the sad refusal to give in to rain, to the hours wasted waiting, to the knowledge that somewhere ahead, a man is waiting who will say, no, we're not hiring today for any reason he wants. You love your brother. Now suddenly you can hardly stand the love flooding you for your brother who's not beside you or behind or ahead because he's home trying to sleep off a miserable night shift at Cadillac so he can get up before noon to study his German. Works eight hours a night so he can sing Wagner, the opera you hate most, the worst music ever invented. <laughs> How long has it been since you told him you loved him? held his wide shoulders, opened your eyes wide, and said those words, and maybe kissed his cheek. You've never done something so simple, so obvious. Not because you're too young or too dumb. Not because you're jealous or even mean or incapable of crying in the presence of another man. No, just because you don't know what work is. For the most part, I've lived in California. Now I live in, in half the year in Brooklyn. 
which is nice. Brooklyn is nice. It's, they tell you it's quiet, and it would be if they would stop rebuilding everything as it crumbles. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is incredibly noisy until nightfall, and then it's, it's beautiful. That's why I sleep all day, <laughs> so that I can enjoy, enjoy the silence. This is a California poem I'm going to read. The, the grapevine is the nickname for a highway that f goes from this great central valley over the Tehachapis into the great basin that is Los Angeles. And you know, if it's rained the day before, you, as you come over, you get this magnificent view for one day. Usually, you see nothing because it's smoggy. When I was a boy, my mother did play Wagner all the time. And I, I seemed to her to hate it more than I actually did. Uh, you know, some of it wasn't bad, but I wasn't going to give her credit for that. Uh, because, you know, you, we all want to discover something. You know, we don't want what our, our parents loved. You want, you, we want to find something else. And Detroit was a great town for jazz. I mean, it was live jazz uh, uh, as a young guy. I mean, I heard, I heard all, almost all the great musicians. Many of them came from Detroit, like uh, Elvin Jones and uh, Tommy Flanagan, Kenny Burrell, and what's it, Milt Jackson. And Art Tatum used to come every year and play uh, at a particular club. It was wonderful. And I introduced my mom to jazz. And lo and behold, she loved it. She absolutely loved it. And this poem comes out of that love that she developed for this music. Soloing. My mother tells me she dreamed of John Coltrane, a young train, playing his music with such joy and contained energy and rage, she could not hold back her tears. And sitting awake now, her hands crossed in her lap, the tears start in her blind eyes. The TV set behind her is gray, expressionless. It is late. The neighbors quiet, even the city, Los Angeles, quiet. I have driven for hours down 99 over the grapevine into heaven to be here. I place my left hand on her shoulder, and she smiles. What a world. A mother and son finding solace in California, just where we were told it would be, among the palm trees and all night supermarkets, pushing orange backlighted oranges at 2 a.m. He was alone, she says, and does not say just as I am, soloing. What a world. A great man half her age comes to my mother in sleep to give her the gift of song, which shaking the tears away she passes on to me. For now I can hear the music of the world in the silence and that word soloing. What a world. When I arrived the great bowl of mountains was hidden in a cloud of exhaust. The sea spread out like a carpet of oil. The roses I had brought from Fresno browned on the seat beside me, and I could have turned back and lost the music. Oh, let me, uh, while I'm at it, let me read a poem I wrote for my mother. Uh, I guess that poem was partly for her. She encouraged, you know, I, I, I taught for many, many years in a state school in California, and I would get these students who would, who would be thrown into conflict by their love of the idea of writing poetry because their parents didn't want them to be poets. And I could understand that. The parents wanted, you know, they wanted to get paid back for their loans, I guess. Uh, and, and, 
I remember I had a student who's become a very successful poet. Los Nenada is his name. He was the first uh, sensei, Japanese uh, second generation, to publish a book of poems in the United States. He's a hell of a poet. He's now the poet laureate of Oregon. Uh, and his mom called me up once and said, Lawson is, is going in the wrong direction. Would you please advise him? <laughs> and I said, no, I don't do that. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, Lawson's going where he wants to go. It's not my business. You have to talk to him. Then years later, she sent me a box of candy and told me that it worked out okay because poetry was an old and honored profession. See, all she had to do was change her vocabulary. <laughs> if you call it a profession, it's, it's legit. <laughs> okay, I want to read this poem about my mom. Most of my poems are largely made up, and I don't think there's a single one that is, you know, literally accurate. I agree, you know, when, you, when your teacher years ago said, be somebody else, you know, because we are somebody else. We are so many different people. We are ourselves at four and seven and eight. You read a poet like Theodore Redke or Dylan Thomas, you see the, the child in those poets is so alive. My mother never gave me that kind of trouble. I was very lucky. She really encouraged me. And, 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 and she read my terrible early poems and, and tears flowed from her eyes and she loaned me the car. <laughs> <laughs> this is called The Mercy. The ship that took my mother to Ellis Island 83 years ago was named The Mercy. She remembers trying to eat a banana without first peeling it and seeing her first orange in the hands of a young Scot, a seaman, who gave her a bite and wiped her mouth for her with a red bandana and taught her the word, orange, saying it patiently over and over. A long autumn voyage, the days darkening with the black waters calming as night came on, then nothing as far as her eyes could see in space without limit, rushing off to the corners of creation. She prayed in Russian, in Yiddish, to find her family in New York, prayers unheard or misunderstood or perhaps ignored by all the powers that swept the waves of darkness before she woke, that kept the mercy afloat while smallpox raged among the passengers and crew until the dead were buried at sea with strange prayers in a tongue she could not fathom. The mercy I read on the yellowing pages of a book I located in the windowless room of the library on 42nd Street, sat 31 days offshore in quarantine before the passengers disembarked. There a story ends. Other ships arrive. Tancred out of Glasgow, the Neptune registered as Danish, Umberto IV, the list goes on for pages. November gives way to winter. The sea pounds this alien shore. Italian miners from Piemonte dig under towns in western Pennsylvania only to rediscover the same nightmare they left at home. A nine-year-old girl travels all night by train with one suitcase and an orange. She learns that mercy is something you can eat again and again while the juice spills over your chin. You can wipe it away with the back of your hands and you can never get enough. God bless you. This, this book has the ridiculous title of Unselected Poems. 
Uh, I was going to publish it with my regular publisher, but he insisted that the title was misleading and awful. My editor did. And I said, no, I, I got to have the title. Uh, so I went to another publisher, a small publisher, and he didn't object. They are unselected poems because they were published by a particular publishing company, Athenaeum, that went broke and all the books fell out of print. And then I did a selected poems, you know, that I didn't want to have everything. And these came from the, the ones that were left aside. It also meant a lot to me because for two reasons. When I was a young man, I went to New York City from Detroit. I wanted to hear Dylan Thomas, who was the rage among poets at the time. I'd heard him once at the University of Michigan, but I was sitting way back, and he was very drunk. And so I didn't get a hell of a lot out of it. So I went to New York. And he said something that I never forgot. He said, he, he started out by reading poems by other people, and then he turned to his own poems and he said, I send my poems out in envelopes. I send them to editors. And sometimes envelopes come back and they have checks in them. And sometimes the poems come back with their tails between their legs. And I thought, the guy sees his poems as sort of living creatures. I was just knocked out by that. And I thought, yeah, and here are my poems. They're, they're nowhere. They don't exist. They're out of print. Then I had a second experience. One morning, when my oldest son was still at home, he looked up from breakfast and said to me, Pop, how many poems do you think you got out there working for you? And I don't know where he got that language, but, but suddenly I, I began to think of myself as a kind of entrepreneur. Uh, and the, my whole attitude toward poetry and myself changed. Uh, so I want to read something from this book, this book of rescue. And now I'm glad they didn't publish it because I own it. And, and I can give the poems away. And, 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 and it's wonderful because the, my publishing company charges a fortune. It's ridiculous. And they keep me, I, I would be on the cover of Esquire magazine if they didn't ask for so much. <laughs> if you believe that, you're very naive. <laughs> I was talking about Detroit being a wonderful city for jazz and this poem grew out of that called Songs. Some of you may recognize the woman in the poem. Songs. Dawn coming in over the fields of darkness takes me by surprise. And I look up from my solitary road, please not to be alone. The birds now choiring from the orange groves, huddling to the low hills. But sorry that this night has ended. A night in which you spoke of how little love we seem to have known, and all of it going from one of us to the other. You could tell the words took me by surprise, as they often will, and you grew shy and held me away for a while, your eyes enormous in the darkness, almost as large as your hunger to see and be seen over and over. Thirty years ago, I heard a woman sing of the motherless child sometimes she felt like. In a white dress, this black woman with a gardenia in her hair leaned on the piano and stared out into the breathing darkness of unknown men and women needing her songs. There were those among us who cried, those who rejoiced that she was back before us for a time, a time not to be much longer for the voice was going and the habit slowly becoming all there was of her. And I believe that night she cared for the purity of the songs and not much else. 
Oh, she still saw the slow gathering of that red dusk that hovered over her cities. And no doubt dawns like this one caught her on the roads from job to job. But the words she'd lived by were drained of mystery as this sky is now. And there was no more easy living. And she was Miss Brown to no one. And no one was her lover man. The only songs that mattered were wordless, like those rising in confusion from the trees or wind songs that waken the grass that slept a century, that waken me to how far we've come. I live in Brooklyn now when I'm in the East. I used to live in Manhattan, but it was in NYU owned the building and they rented it to me in a, my, not the building, but a, an apartment very reasonably. But then I thought I don't want to teach anymore. So I got my own place. My students were immensely relieved. <laughs> uh, but when I lived in Manhattan, it was so expensive that, that for entertainment we walked, my wife and I, and we liked to walk. Jennifer and I were talking about how much, in New York especially, how wonderful it is to walk. And I lived on Bleecker Street, and usually I would go over to Broadway and walk downtown. Because the farther down you got, the crazier and more wonderful and more varied it got. And I just loved it. And one day I saw a man who came up to me. And this poem is about an exchange. And he was a man who, for me, had stepped out of poetry. I knew he wasn't, but in a way he also was. The great Spanish poet Juan Ramon writes a poem about a man he sees on the street. That would have been about 1912, 14. And then in 1929, the great Spanish poet Garcia Lorca also writes a poem, believing that he saw the same man that Juan Ramon saw. Well, when I saw this man in 1970-something, I knew it wasn't the same man, but I realized I probably passed him many, many times. I just didn't have my eyes open. And this day I did. It's called The Poem of Chalk. On the way to Lower Broadway this morning, I faced a tall man speaking to a piece of chalk held in his right hand. The left was open, and it kept the beat. For his speech had a rhythm, was a chant or dance, perhaps even, in a, even a poem in French for he was from Senegal and spoke French so slowly and precisely that I could understand as though hurled back 50 years to my high school classroom. A slender man, elegant in his manner, neatly dressed in the remnants of two blue suits, his tie fixed squarely, his white shirt spotless, though unironed. He knew the whole history of chalk, not only of this particular piece, but also the chalk with which I wrote my name the day they welcomed me back to school after the death of my father. He knew feldspar, he knew calcium, oyster shells. He knew what creatures had given their spines to become the dust time pressed into these perfect cones. He knew the sadness of classrooms in December when the light fails early and the words on the blackboard abandon their grammar and sense, and then even their shapes, so that each letter points in every direction at once and means nothing at all. At first I thought his short beard was frosted with chalk. As we stood face to face, no more than a foot apart, I saw the hairs were white, for though youthful in his gestures, he was like me, an aging man. 
though far nobler in appearance, with his high carved cheekbones, his broad shoulders, and clear dark eyes. He had the bearing of a king of lower Broadway, someone out of the mind of Shakespeare or Garcia Lorca, someone for whom loss had sweetened into charity. We stood for that one long minute, the two of us, sharing the final poem of chalk while the great city raged around us. And then the poem ended, as all poems do, and his left hand dropped to his side abruptly, and he handed me the piece of chalk. I bowed, knowing how large a gift this was, and wrote my thanks on the air, where it might be heard forever below the seashell's stiffening cry. I, I want to read a poem I never read. I don't know why, I like it. I mean, I, those were separate statements. <laughs> I think I know why I like it. Uh, and it, it came out of the craziest experience. I got a letter one day from a woman who heard me read in Pasadena. And she felt at that time that an immortal bond was being forged between the two of us. And I didn't remember her. And she went into great detail about our relationship, which I hadn't known existed. <laughs> and then she said, by now you must have guessed I am a dancer. <laughs> and uh, I thought, uh, <laughs> I thought I had an imagination, but she's, uh, she's so far beyond me. Uh, I get a lot of letters, it seems, from older women. Who, who, read the, who read poetry and think, oh, I know his soul. Uh, <laughs> thank God that's all they know, you know. <laughs> okay. This is called Ode for Mrs. William Settle. The name comes from a different letter. Uh, there's a, mention, a reference to Tassar Vallejo. He was a, a very great Peruvian poet who wrote an exquisite memorial for his brother who died when they were young. And it's, it's an astonishing poem. The best translation is by James Wright, the beautiful translation. Ode for Mrs. William Settle. In Lake Forest, a suburb of Chicago, a woman sits at her desk to write me a letter. She holds a photograph of me up to the light, one taken 17 years ago in a high school class in Providence. She sighs and the sigh smells of mouthwash and tobacco. If she were writing by candlelight, she would now be in the dark for a living flame would refuse to be fed by such pure exhaustion. Actually, she is in the dark. For the man she's about to address in her odd prose had a lifespan of 125th of a second in the eye of a Nikon. Then he politely asked the photographer to get lost, whispering the request so as not to offend the teacher presiding. Those students are now in their 30s. The Episcopal girls in their plaid skirts and bright crested blazers have gone unprepared, though French speaking, into a world of liars, pimps, and brokers. 2.7% have died by their own hands, and all the others have considered the act at least once. 
Not one now remembers my name. Not one recalls the reading I gave of Cesar Vallejo's great memoriam to his brother Miguel. Not even the girl who sobbed and had to be escorted to the school nurse, calmed and sent home in a cab. Evenings in Lake Forest in mid-December drop suddenly. One moment the distant sky is a great purple canvas and then it's gone. And no stars emerge, however not the least hint of the stockyards or slaughterhouses is allowed to drift out to the suburbs. So it's a deathless darkness with no more perfume than cellophane. Quote, our souls are mingling somewhere in the open spaces between Illinois and you, she writes. When I read the letter two weeks later, forwarded by my publisher, I will suddenly discover a truth of our lives on earth. And I'll bless Mrs. William Settle of Lake Forest for giving me more than I gave her, for addressing me as Mr. Levine, the name my father bore, a name a man could take with courage and pride into the empire of death. I'll read even unto the second page, unstartled by the phrase, by now you must have guessed I am a dancer. Soon snow will fall on the Tudor houses of the suburbs, turning the elegant parked sedans into anonymous mounds. The winds will sweep in over the Rockies and across the great freezing plains where America first died. Winds so fierce boys and men turn their backs to them and simply weep. And yet in all that air, the soul of Mrs. William Settle will not release me, not even for one second. Male and female, aged and middle-aged, we ride it out, blown eastward toward our origins, one impure being become wind. Above the Middle West, truth and beauty are one, though never meant to be. Mrs. Settle, if you're in the audience tonight, I honor you. You are a great dreamer. You know, these books have striking covers, by the way. And you get these photographs with the book. <laughs> and if you cut them out, you, they're suitable for framing. <laughs> this is a great photograph by Lewis Hine of a 12-year-old girl who works in South Carolina, who worked back near the beginning of the 20th century in a cotton mill. Um, there are among us, though not in this room, those who would like to see 12-year-old girls back there being busy. Some of them will run for president. But I don't want to mention names. Uh, after all, I am the Poet Laureate, and I must not take a stand. I must stand, you know, just wavering like those people who never get into paradise. You find, them in, you find them in Dante, very unhappy. Uh, let me try and find something depressing. <laughs> I, uh, I was sure I had something monumentally depressing. Once I stood before an audience, this is true, looking for a poem, and it went on and on. And I was sure that if I turned the next page, it would be there. And then I realized that it was a poem I'd never finished. <laughs> But in my head, I, I couldn't finish it. Somehow my intelligence or my imagination or whatever it is that allows you to finish poems just didn't function. 
but I had a dream of what it would be like. It was glorious. <laughs> Only it didn't exist. Uh, there is an anthology that comes out almost every year called Best Spiritual Writing. And almost every year, I'm in it. And to me, this is a mystery. I, I regard myself as one of the least spiritual beings. I had a cat that was more spiritual than I. It had more character, too. It was loyal, never overate. It was wonderful. I don't know. But I'm glad to be in it with all those ministers and priests and nuns. It's really wonderful. <laughs> and this, this poem, which is a religious poem, is the one poem that was eligible and the guy chose something else. Something about, you know, assembling car tires or something, I don't remember. This is called Houses in Order. For those of you who don't go to New York, the Williamsburg Bridge is one of those that spans the East River. And it goes from Manhattan to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And people in Manhattan think, it's a don't take that bridge, it's a disaster. You'll wind up in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, okay. Houses in order. In cardboard boxes under the Williamsburg Bridge, a congregation of mature rats founds a new order based on the oldest religious principle. They eat whatever they can get their teeth into. By day they move slowly about their kingdom. Some days so slowly they seem for hours on end to become holy relics or the stained brown backgrounds to events foretold in parables to do with the savor of salt, the mysteries of mustard seeds, meat, bones, loaves, and fishes. When you look back, they're gone into water or air. They've joined the falling rain that makes vision so difficult, even for the visionary. The little houses keep their secrets the way windowless houses always do, though their walls and roofs proclaim the hour's holy names, Nike and Converse, Panasonic and Walkman. And though they let light leak in through their teeth-torn ports and darkness out from under their lids, they're closed to all but the eyes of the faithful. These dull pilgrims contemplate the business of gathering and hunting while the day hangs on and the traffic drones on the bridge above. Soon the headlights come on singly or in pairs. The rain gleams through the taut cables. No moon rises above the island where now they are among us, each one doing a morsel of God's work until their small jaws ache from so much prayer. I don't know, he didn't like it. Oh, we're, we're running on and on. Here's a poem with a religious title, and I don't know if it's religious or not. I really don't. It's called Gospel, and it takes place in, this, in the lower peaks of the Sierra Nevadas, which are, you know, I live in Fresno. I've been there for years. I'm ashamed to admit how long, because it's an awful place. Uh, you know, those mountains go up. They're huge. And when you, when you get in them, they're vast. The mountains are vast. You, 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 you know, in five minutes, you don't know where you are. You know you're in some place that, that you should be and that it was worth it. It's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. And I often go up there when, when I feel confused or conflicted by life. And I've, I do find something worth, worth finding. Gospel, of course, the word means the good news. 
<clears throat> gospel, and I'm using it ironically here. The new grass rising in the hills, the cows loitering in the morning chill, a dozen or more old browns hidden in the shadows of the cottonwoods beside the stream bed. I go higher to where the road gives up and there's only a faint path strewn with lupin between the mountain oaks. I don't ask myself what I'm looking for. I didn't come for answers to a place like this. I came to walk on the earth, still cold, still silent, still ungiving, I've said to myself, although it greets me with last year's dead thistles and this year's hard spines, early blooming wild onions, the curling remains of spider's cloth. What did I bring to the dance? In my back pocket, a crushed letter from a woman I've never met bearing bad news I can do nothing about. So I wander these woods half sightless while a west wind picks up in the trees clustered above. The pines make a music like no other, rising and falling like a distant surf at night that calms the darkness before first light. Suffing, we call it, from Old English no less. How weightless words are when nothing will do. And this is my most recent book, which, let me find something to read. Uh, I'm not going to name anybody, but I have a dear friend who was going to title a book, Lectures on Love, a book of poems. He asked me what I thought of the title. I said, it would be hard to think of a worse title. <laughs> people don't like to be lectured. Well, you people are students. You know, you know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> we, uh, when I was, a t I'm no longer a teacher, but when I was a teacher, you know, I, I didn't mind. We looked in this room, there was a guy down here, I don't know, he was solving, you know, some incredible physics problem. And, and I admired the way he walked around as though he knew something. Those scientists, they had to jump on us. Anyway, I offered the title. I said, why don't you call it Of Love and Other Disasters? <laughs> and he, he mused over that. And he said, and, I, and this surprised me what he said. He said, I'll see what my wife thinks. <laughs> I knew he was lost. <laughs> so I took the title for a poem myself. I thought, hell, I tried to give it to him. He doesn't know generous. I'm not a generous person, and he is, so he didn't recognize it in me. So I, I, before I read it, I'd like to thank you. You've been a wonderful audience, responsive to my idiocy, and, and quiet and listened, and I thank you for your attention, and I thank especially Jennifer, for bringing me here to Rochester. Of Love and Other Disasters. The punch press operator from up north met the assembler from West Virginia in a bar near the stadium. Friday, late, but too early to go home alone. Neither had anything in mind, so they conversed about the upcoming baseball season, about which neither cared. We could be a couple, he thought. But she was all wrong, way too skinny. For years, he'd had an image of the way a woman should look, and it wasn't her. It wasn't anyone he'd ever known, certainly not his ex-wife, who'd moved back north to live with her high school sweetheart about killed him. I don't need that shit, he almost said aloud, and then realized she'd been talking to someone, maybe to him, about how she couldn't get her hands right, how the grease ate so deeply into her skin it became a part of her. And she put her hand palm up on the bar and pointed with her cigarette at the deep lines 
the work had carved. The lifeline, he said, which one is that? None, she said. And he noticed that her eyes were hazel, flecked with tiny spots of gold, and then embarrassed, looked back at her hand, which seemed tiny and delicate, the fingers yellowed with calluses, but slender and fine. She took a paper napkin, napkin off the bar, spit on it, and told him to hold still while she carefully lifted his glasses, leaving him half blind and wiped something off just above his left cheekbone. There, she said, handing him back his glasses. I got it. And even with his glasses on, what she showed him was nothing he could see, maybe only make-believe. He thought, better get out of here before it's too late but suspected too late was what he wanted. Thank you.